Hi everyone. Welcome back to the Little Green Pasture. It's great to be back. I hope everybody had a very happy Thanksgiving. So I'm back on again. I woke up this morning early like I normally do and I just went right into prayer and reading the word and I'm going to share a dream I had with you in just a moment. But to preface it, I'm going to say a few things about why I believe I have this dream. And as I always do, I always pray first. Amen. Let's give all our attention to the Lord, okay? Our dear Father in heaven, it is with privileged joy that I come before you, Lord, as a vessel of mercy prepared aforetime for your glory. That, Lord, that through me you would speak, that I will obviously be talking but let them hear your sound and help me lord to convey this message lord not just to the best of my ability but to the very best ability of your holy spirit the breath of life and jesus i ask you to take the words of my heart Lord, and let them be only because they were the words of your heart. And as I'm speaking, I'm listening to you. I ask that you speak to all that will ever hear the words of this message and that for the rest of their lives, they will never forget it. And I thank you now. I ask for your presence, for your power, and for the witness from on high to be upon this message and that the good hand of the Lord rest upon me and upon all those who love you, Jesus. In your precious name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. So for about a couple of weeks, I don't know. I kind of do this at the end of the year. It's not quite the end, but we're getting there. Time is moving fast these days. And as usual, I start to really think about what the year has been, the service to the Lord, just the going over of things, you know. And I was really thinking about this little green pasture and all these messages that are just always flowing out, but I never take them for granted. I never ever for one moment think, well, next week I'm going to say this and I'm going to say that because I do know that anything can happen and not to boast of tomorrow, which is not a boast, but I don't like to get ahead. And in so doing for the last couple of weeks, I was really, I felt some wrestling and struggling with inside of myself and it was good. It's good when we find ourselves at a place where we're just not taking the word for granted. And many of us know the word very well. We don't call ourselves experts. We're not know-it-alls, but we're old in the faith. There's many older than us, but something happens and we're sensitive to the Lord and to the Holy Spirit that, you know, sometimes he kind of puts a cap on the fountain and I'm glad that he does that because in the younger days, I would be like, oh no, what's happening? Where is, you know, I don't do that anymore. I say, no. It's good for me that you put a cap on the fountain. You know, there's a, a scripture and song of Solomon. It says, uh, it talks about the fountain. It says, I am a spring shut up, a fountain sealed. And what that means uh, was there was a spring that they would refer to as a fountain that would only belong to the king. And that the king was the only one allowed to drink from that fountain so when the king was not drinking from it it was capped up it was a spring shut up a fountain sealed because it was only for him to drink from and no one else and it assured other people that they were not to drink from that springing water and that fountain and so you know i look at him and i i thank him and i i, I had this wrestling and i was like i had all these questions for him i'm not going to go with what my questions are it's too private and too personal but it's really a really going over of things you know like just like i said it's personal but 
you know, am I in the right place? You know, just to give you a sample, am I in the right place? Am I doing your will? Is there something else I'm not, uh, am I taking something for granted? Um, am I going in circles? All these things, like, I want him to be honest with me. You want him to be honest with you. And don't ever take teaching or preaching. Or if some of you, maybe you, you're so full of knowledge and, and which is not a bad thing. I mean, we do need to refer to people who know more than us. And we, we learn there's a stream of knowledge and wisdom that comes from that. But I'm talking about to the average lay person, you know, and maybe to you, if you're even a pastor and you're listening and I'm just your sister talking to you, um, that it's good that he does that to us because it makes us stop in our tracks and truly ask the question and not to be afraid when that happens, but to look upwards and not, and to say, God, what is it? Is there something? Well, so I think I've made that point clear. So for like two weeks, I just, I kept inching my way and inching my way and inching my way in prayer uh, to get to his throne. And so, and so to speak, prayerfully speaking, because there was things I wanted to ask him that I was afraid to ask him because I thought, I know this is going to sound crazy because you guys know me. Well, I don't want him to think that I don't trust him and I don't want him to think uh, that I'm doubting him. It had nothing to do with doubt or fears, but a real adult way of saying, you know, let's sit at the table, Lord, put it out there. I'm your servant. What do you want me to do? And so yesterday morning, I got up and I was praying away to the Lord and I just, you know, and I didn't read in all these two weeks. Let me say I heard nothing like literally nothing, which is fine by me because I have learned through my life. And we should all learn through our life that we are going to be brought to a place in the Lord where we're not going to hear from the Lord. We're not going to hear of his word in our hearts. We're not going to get a sense from the Holy Spirit or um we're not going to get an unction. You know, I think of the words that it says in, uh, about Abraham. I think it's, oh, don't quote me. I want to be careful. I think it's chapter 32, but don't quote me. Where it says there's a conversation in heaven with God and his son, Jesus Christ, who's not known yet to anybody. But it says, shall we tell Abraham what we are about to do? For I know him that he will uh, teach his children and so forth. I, I know him. I know his character. And, you know, there's times that all the ones that we've loved so much in Old Testament stories and through the centuries and thousands of years, they had to go by raw faith and whom they know and rely on the character of God. And so the more you spend time in his word, the more you're getting his mind, the more the word you're, is becoming part of you, you're being soaked in it. And so when those times come where maybe God's saying, well, let's not tell her or him what we're about to do, but we'll let him choose, right? And most of the time, that's what we do. So I, my husband got up in the morning and he just, he wanted to have a little bit of fellowship time. So we were talking and, and we were talking about that song, I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back, no turning back. And I had shown him a little video before the day before that. So a couple days ago, the story, cause he didn't know the story. And so the story goes really briefly, if you do not know, and I'll add the link so you can watch it. Cause it's beautiful. There was a missionary who went to Northern India, Northern central India to an area where there were cannibals. And he had spent time there and he had led one man and his wife to salvation. And that man was full of life. God breathed in him that new life. He was born again. His wife was born again. His teaching his little children. I don't know their ages. I have a feeling they were small. And then he started to teach others in the village and other people started to come to Christ. Well, word got to the chief and the chief brought him and his wife and two children before him. And that chief said to him, uh, basically, you can watch a whole, watch the video, but it was something to this effect. Um, we don't like what you are teaching everybody in this village, and we want it to stop. And if you do not stop, we are going, I'm, you know, we're, it's, 
we're going to kill your children. Now you can choose right now to renounce what you're teaching. And if not, your children are going to be killed. And he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. And he, the children were slain before him. And the chief said, I'm going to give you another chance. Renounce this Jesus that you're teaching. Stop it at once or else your wife will die. He said, I have, he said, the cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. And then he said, the chief was alarmed and he said, you renounce it now or you're going to die. And I forgot the exact words, but he said the rest of the words of that song and said, no turning back, no turning back. I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. And he was slain. And at that sight, that chief was so moved that he received Jesus Christ. And those that slain the family received Christ. And I spoke to John and my husband was like, it's a good thing I wasn't there. And I'm like, yeah, but John, um, I mean, he gets it. He, you know, he understands, but he was like, he was upset about the story. I said, John, do you understand that the power of the Holy Spirit was around them? When God chooses a person to be martyred, do you think he leaves them alone? You think all the people in the world that he knew would be martyred? You think that they would, he left them alone? And I explained to him, I said, he gives them power of the endless life. It be, he begins to let it come in so that they don't feel anything and that they're fearless. And the presence of the Holy Spirit is so powerful in that place that even the persecutors come under that power. And they want Jesus. You know, you've heard about the 40 wrestlers wrestling, the 40 wrestlers of Rome. I'll add that too to the bottom. Uh, so, but what I'm saying is this. I began to say, look, what Satan hates is the breath of all mankind, the breath of those that are born again. And I began to talk about the breath of God and the breath of life. And all of a sudden, the power of the Holy Spirit came into our living room. And then I began to be filled with the Holy Spirit and I could feel the power of the Holy Spirit and his breath coming out of me. And it was real. And I don't even remember everything I said because it was the Holy Spirit and his witness and his power that was coming forth. It was almost too much, but I felt the power of the endless life and I got a minuscule taste of it. And I was telling my husband all about the breath of life. And how Satan wants to cut it off because Satan can do nothing about the breath of life. Once God has breathed it into Adam and Eve, Adam, and then, of course, the breath of life goes on all the way to our life. That's why he wants to kill children in the womb. He wants to kill God's breath of life. So anyways, we went on for the day. Now, last night I had a dream. In my dream, I dreamed. I was sitting at a table and there was nothing on the table, but there was a box and the lid was open. It was about this big and about this tall, like this, just kind of, you know, a box and the lid was open and it was an old box. It looked like an ancient box. It was beat up. It was dark green and dented and it was an ugly box. Like it's just, ugh. anyways, it was just ugly. And there's, there was all kinds of junk in it, you know? Like just because I remember looking at there was nothing else on the table. So I looked in and I was like, I don't know. I mean, it just looked like a bunch of garbage. And I thought to myself and somebody came and began to talk to me, but I would kept becoming distracted by that box. And so I looked over at that box and I took my hand like this to pull the lid down. But I felt instantly a, the power of the enemy came in with a great force with and i can feel the emotion of that evil spirit it had such rage against me not just anger not just insult it had rage like emotional 
rage against me. And so when I looked into, look, as I leaned forward upon that box and put my hand on it to pull the lid, I felt a force of wind come out of that box into my face, like somebody pointing um, a blow dryer in my face. I'm trying to give you an example, the best that I can, because, you know, it just blasted into my face. And I mean, it came like a blast of wind more than anything that uh, a blow dryer can do. And while it was blasting wind into my face or this wind or air or whatever, I could feel the strength and power of this spirit. He did not want me to close this box. And I took both hands and with all of my might, as I was pulling the box, you know, like when you get two magnets and there's two opposite ends and you can feel something in between and it bounces and you have to force it. That's the best way I could say that there was a an invisible force in that box that was stronger than me, my carnal, natural self. And so that wind was blasting into my face and the powers of that demonic rage were coming out of that wind. And I, and it was confronting me. And I knew even in that dream, I knew in my dream that it, that was happening because of the, what happened the morning before and something happened with the enemy and he was mocking me like he was trying to show his own wind and his force of power. But I remember as I was pulling the lid down, I doubled down and in my spirit, I go, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And it lit went down just like that. And I woke up and I felt the power of the enemy very prolifically in this room. Well, I knew what it meant. I got up a little while later and I stood in my living room and I said, and I don't like talking to the enemy, not unless I feel that the Holy Spirit has give, given me permission, but I said to him, and I say this humbly because I know I'm nothing and it's only the spirit that fights that spirit, that evil spirit. But greater is he that is in me that's in the world. So I said, do you have no power at all against me unless it be given to you from above? And you have no power over me. And I went into it and I went and sat down. And as I was sitting there in prayer and in thought, I realized that what the Lord, see, the Lord allowed that. And the Lord allowed me to see that, see, demons, the evil spirits that belong to Satan, Satan doesn't have breath. He's not a life-giving spirit. He doesn't have breath. Evil spirits, they don't have breath. Spirits don't have breath. We have breath. You know, it says in Genesis 2, 7, in the beginning, it says, and the Lord God formed man of the dust and of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. And so we see a distinction here is made here only man and not animal, although the breath of life for animals is in them too, for the living, all things that are living, that have life, that must breathe, right? Man and animal but we're not animals. Um, it says in Genesis 7, 15, and they went into Noah, into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. Job 12, 10 says, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing in the breath of all mankind. And in Job 33, 4, he says, the spirit of God made me and the breath of the almighty hath given me life. And there's one here that means more to me than anything. See, Satan hates that breath of God in you and me. And he doesn't want us. He doesn't care who's breathing as long as they're in sin or doing whatever it is that they're doing. But man, I'll tell you something. When you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that breath of life, he's got a problem with you and he's got a problem with me. In Psalm 104, 29, this really struck me in the last couple of years. It just, I saw it. It says, thou hidest thy face. 
they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. So basically, when a child is conceived, it has a soul. It gets its soul from both parents. Along with its soul is given the breath of life at birth. And then at death, he takes away their breath. He takes away our breath and we die. And his spirit is sent forth into new births that are constantly happening. God gives that breath of life. And he renews the face of the earth. You know, it says in Psalm 146, his breath goeth forth. He returneth to his, returneth to his earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. I want you to see the very significance of this breath because now see we were before we were born again we were given the breath of life at our birth but when Jesus was resurrected from his death in John 2022 20, it says and when he had said this he breathed on them and said receive ye the holy spirit now to begin with it was customary for the prophets to use some significant act to represent the nature of their message. In this case, the act of breathing was used to represent the nature of the influence that would come upon them and the source of that influence. So when man was created, God breathed into him the breath of life. So this was before Jesus, right? So. When he breathed on them, this first points back to the first Adam receiving the breath of life. Here, it is the last man, Adam, giving the breath of life. So here, the second man, Adam, the life-giving spirit, which we can read about in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 45, was represented as visibly conferring on those who he now sends forth to complete the mission of grace, the divine life, which would make them new creatures and bestow on them power to generate the same spirit in others. They, us, will have power to do this by bearing testimony to that which we see and know to be the fact and case about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, you know, when we look at back at Genesis 2, 7, you know, the word spirit, I mean, the word breath is the same word, well, I don't know if I want to keep going into that. I just want to get you to understand about this breath of life. So really, when Jesus says, receive ye the Holy Ghost, his breathing on them was a certain sign or a pledge that they would be endowed with the influences of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It was a symbolic conveyance of that, uh, of them, of the Spirit. It was an earnest of the first fruits of a more copious, copious Pentecostal infusion so let me just stop right there so what i received so powerfully from that dream is something that i have noticed that the enemy does in dreams he always overplays his hand and so i saw that the breath in me because i've been baptized by the holy spirit is that the breath in me that new breath of life made me alive I've been made alive by the new birth. I've been made alive. And then I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. That I received the power to receive the gifts, to testify like I just read to you. And so it's not just my breath, my human breath, where it will be taken away one day when I die or be raptured. So, but the point I'm making is let's just talk about death. Because this is the point. You have a human breath, but when you're born again, you've been given the breath of life by the power of the Holy Spirit being a new creature. You have new breath. You know, when you come out of your mother's womb, you gasp, right? They spank you, you cry, and your lungs are now open up. You're no longer breathing underwater. Um, you're breathing air. But when we're born again, Christ breathes upon us and we receive the Holy Spirit. 
and his wind. Jesus says in John 3, 8, the wind listeth where it will. You hear the sound thereof, but no man knows where it comes from and neither whither it goeth. So is everyone that's born of the spirit. You see, Satan's not born of any spirit. He is the evil spirit. And I understood in that dream because he was mocking that wind in me. I, I was speaking about with my husband, John. In other words, that blast of wind that was coming against me and his force of power and his contention against me and confronting me and mocking me. I knew what it meant, but I gained wisdom from it. And I thanked the Lord and I said, thank you, Lord that you have shown me that this breath of life, you know, you've heard that saying, don't waste your breath on that person or don't waste your breath on that. That took on new meaning to me, though. I know it's a, a worldly saying. And it made me understand that our breath that we're given, that we want to have that breath. See, Satan doesn't want you to talk about Jesus. He doesn't want you to give a testimony about the glorious things he has done for you. Satan doesn't want you to pray. He doesn't want you. He wants to shut you up. He wants you to be some kind of a, just you be quiet. Don't say anything. But I'll tell you something I know now for the rest of my life from that dream that God allowed me to have, that the breath that is in me, that I'm going to make sure that every breath in me and you too, you make sure now that every breath inside of you that you make sure all the words that you speak, use your breath, use your breath. See, there's nothing they can do about your breath. You know why? Because your breath doesn't belong to you. you. The breath, every breath that you're breathing is ordained for you and belongs to God. You know why it says that in the word in Job 12, 10. In Job 12, 10, it says right here, it says, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind and he's the one it says it says in the word you know it says that in isaiah 42 5 it says thus saith god the lord he that created the heavens and stretched them out he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it he that giveth breath unto the people upon it and spirit to them that walk therein but you see there comes a moment where it says that you're time to die and so he's the one that takes away their breath and they die. And then he's constantly refurnishing, recreating through the wombs of women. That's why Satan wants to kill babies in their womb, because he hates God's breath of life. Remember, I explained it to you. When a child is conceived, it has a soul. It gets its soul from both parents. And along with its soul is given the breath of life from God. But then there comes a moment, like I just said, he taketh away their breath, they dieth right? They return to the earth. The body is made of this earth. So what am I saying here to you? Let me just, let me just say this. You know, the Lord really spoke to me this morning because I really just had a moment of breaking. And I just really said to him some things that just came out of me and it needed to come out. And, you know, I just asked him, tell me, Lord, what do you want me to do? Because Lord, and I'm just, you know, this little pocket of something I'm sharing with you. I said, you know, Lord, right, right now, everybody's getting ready to go shopping and everybody is running from one place to another. And everybody wants a five minute meditation. And everybody wants to say the Lord told them this and the Lord told them that. And they want drive through sermons and they want uh, cheap junk food gospel. They don't want to own anything. They just Give it to me and I got to go. I got things to do. I got to do this and got to go do that. And so there's no life in them. They're not been made alive. They're breathing only this breath. But people that are alive in the Lord, Satan has a contention with. And so that spirit that was allowed to come into my dream and to confront me made me know for the rest of my life that when Jesus Christ breathed that life in me, that he made me understand in this answer that he gave me, because I said, Lord, you can do with me whatever you like, whatever you want, whatever you will do. You notice when Jesus speaks to his disciples, every time he speaks to his disciples, he gives them a choice. 
He always says, if you shall be my disciples, if this, if that. But he tells Paul the apostle when he says Jesus, he says to the uh says to Jesus on the road to Damascus, he says, Lord, what will you have me do? And he says, go into Damascus and there I will tell you what you must do. And that's the only time God says that to a person. And so I spoke to him. I said, Lord, show me what I must do. Show me what I must do. I said, because right now I don't even know who's hearing your word anymore. And I'm not going to try to come up with clever sermons. I'm not going to try to teach this or teach. Yeah, once in a while, I'll show up on a minute to midnight. I love to give those good messages. But I know my heart is in the Lord. And I I know that this is what Jesus wants me to do is to preach his word and to stay, keep it on the fairway as you golfers know what that means. And so this morning, as I was looking things up, I, the Lord spoke to me in this word and he said, in 2 Timothy, he used this word to speak to me. Chapter four, starting at verse one, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. And when I heard that, man, I knew the Lord spoke to me. I mean, it's like when the, you know, notice when the man that was crippled at the gate beautiful, when he said, arise and walk. I mean, you know, he said, give me thy hand. And he lifted him up. And his ankle bones were strengthened. He stood up and he leaped and walked. Notice when the Holy Spirit enters in, your spirit leaps. Just like John Baptist when he was in his mother's womb. And Mary came to visit Elizabeth. And she came and she greeted Elizabeth. And Elizabeth said, as soon as the babe in my womb heard your voice, he leaped in my womb. He leaped in my womb. My, my spirit leaped. My spirit leaped when he said, preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap up to themselves teachers having itching ears. And so then he goes down and says, but watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry and i say that to you make full proof see there is it is hard to preach the word sometimes it is hard to teach bible studies we come up against all kinds because it is a fight we're always in a fight we're in a fight to get home soldiers aren't made at ice cream parties that's what bh clendenin said and i love it but we become soldiers by getting shot at by the enemy I love something that a Cuban pastor said. He said, we didn't become pastors in seminaries. We became pastors in the cane fields at midnight. And so, you know, when I saw that, the Lord was acknowledging, I know it's tough. I know it's hard. Because you guys, if you know anything, and I know many of you do, and I make myself nothing. When the Lord really does call you to teach and preach, and I don't care what sphere of influence you are, wherever you're at, we are going to be met. If you are really breathing that breath of God out, you're breathing it with his word. And that is something Satan can do nothing about. Just like in my dream, when I began to say that name, because there's power in his name, there is nothing that he can do. And that lid was shut and his mouth was shut. That wind, that false wind, which by the way, that false wind is also the false doctrines that are so permeated. The beautiful, pure words and doctrines once delivered unto all the saints. You know what it is? It's an evil wind. It's a destroying wind, but not the wind of the Holy Spirit, not the Dumas, not the power, not the Numa, rather. The Numa is the spirit and the wind. I mean, think about it, even Israel. He talks about Israel, you know, in uh, Ezekiel, the prophetic new life for the nation of Israel, where God spoke to him and said, Ezekiel says, then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, 
come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And I say to myself when I read that this morning, when God breathed upon those men and that breath of life went on now, just like when we were born from our mother's womb, and we received God's breath of life. And now when we're born again, we are born again and we are breathed upon. And now we are breathed new breath of life of the new creature comes in us. And when now we preach and we teach and we testify of the doctrines of Jesus Christ and his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his now being seated at the right hand of God, upholding all things by the word of his power. Now you're going to know, use that breath. That breath doesn't belong to you. It belongs to him. It belongs to him. And I tell you, now that we have been born again, that we have been breathed upon as those that were already dead in our trespasses and sin, for we were, and now we live because we're a new creature. So now, as long as you live, breathe when you speak. You know, Satan, he trades in the souls of men as where is the breath of the living because he doesn't have breath. See, our breath makes it possible for us to speak through our voices. And he doesn't want you to speak about the words of eternal life and of repentance unto salvation and of the gifts of God and of his glory and his power and his majesty and of his soon and coming moment we're all waiting for. Don't get caught up in a bunch of things and talking and gossip. See, that's that dirty breath of Satan. Even it said of Saul, it says, while he was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the church of God, he desired letters from the Pharisees. See, Satan will use somebody's breath to breathe out threatenings and slaughterings and gossip and mischief and cursing and cussing. And if you are truly born again, you have to get rid of that. You have to stop cussing. You have to stop because every word of God is pure and it's born upon the wings of his wind his spirit and it's not okay and in closing i want to say this i had a friend of mine named dave neal i've spoken about this before but it's befitting for this he is now home to be with the lord and he was from england he was a beautiful probably one of the last intercessors of his generation because he died in his 80s you know at probably 2010 around there but he said to me one day i was said hey dave what did you do this week and he said well i went to go visit a woman in her 90s who was a missionary her whole life and he said i said to her well you are very old now one day very soon you're going to go to heaven and he said Joni, she looked up at me and she said to me on earth we breathe as air, but in heaven, we will breathe as glory. Breathe on us, O breath of life. Amen. Amen. On earth, we breathe as air, and heaven, we will breathe his glory.